Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Katie Gates Calderon. I am a partner here at Shook in the Kansas City office, and I am one of the co -leader leaders of our food, beverage, and agribusiness industry group. Um, and one of the questions that we get a lot uh, as regulatory attorneys recently is what about cannabis? And so I think that the wonderful marketing folks who put together this CLE thought, how are we going to follow up on two living legends like John Barquette and Victor Schwartz? And the answer is marijuana. <laughs> so um, here we are. So um, <clears throat> what we're first gonna do is just show you a few headlines to um, demonstrate <coughs> how much we're seeing cannabis in the news and how much I suspect all of you all are as well. Uh, so here are a few headlines that we pulled. For a buck and sometimes a buzz, brewers are putting cannabis into cans, of course referring to beer. Uh, this headline is from November. According to the TTB, which is the federal industry or federal uh, regulatory group that handles uh, what can and cannot go into beer, this is no longer acceptable, but I just wanted to point out that the headline was from before uh, the last month or two when that happened. Uh, Seth Rogen launches weed company to make it easier for people to learn to love cannabis. What a guy. Uh, futuristic cannabis farming, farming is here. Uh, got hemp, new regulations <clears throat> coming for CBD oil products, and we'll talk more about that, but that's referring to uh, FDA and other federal agencies trying to figure out how the, the government will, if at all, regulate some of these products that we're seeing uh, quite literally everywhere uh, on shelves these days. Uh, Martha Stewart will advise cannabis grower on products for human and pets. So you know that this is big when Martha's involved. Um, is CBD helpful or is it just hype? Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about that. I think you probably all have seen, like we have, um, claims that CBD can do everything from relieve headaches to stress to tension. Um, I think some, some producers have made claims that it cures cancer, uh, and FDA does not like any of that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we're seeing some more, what I would call local or regional headlines, talking about actions by individual government entities who are cracking down on the use of CBD. So you see New York City cracks down on business selling CBD-infused food and drinks. Uh, cannabis comes to your coffee and candy, but is it legal? Answer, probably not, maybe, uh, which we'll talk more about. And then mainstream companies back marijuana banking. And so with that, I'm gonna hand off to Lindsay, who's gonna talk about some of the products that we're seeing with CBD in them. Hi, so I'm Lindsay Hines, another one of the partners here at Shook, and I co-lead the food and agribusiness and beverage practice uh, with Katie. Um, so CBD products, as Katie alluded to earlier, are everywhere. These are just a few examples on the slide that you can see, CBD and hemp-based products. We're even starting to see these products pop up in major retailers. Um, Bed Bath & Beyond is one that comes to mind, which is selling some CBD-infused oils. And you know, I think people used to think of these as things that you would see in kind of these little one-off um, shops, and that is true, but again, we're seeing them in major retailers as well. Um, so in addition to kind of these uh, products being sold online or in stores like Bed Bath & Beyond, as I alluded to earlier, we're seeing these um, retail concepts popping up everywhere and we're legal for marijuana as well. And for that, I'm gonna toss it to Paul. He's from our Denver office, so he can um, speak more broadly to these issues, so to speak. Thanks, Lindsay. Business is <clears throat> booming in cannabis in Colorado. I grew up here in Kansas City, and when we opened our office in Denver in 2014, I now spend time in both. And these are the kinds of places I see every day in and out. In fact, this particular one, Maggie's Farm, took over where I bought my gas. This is my neighbor down the street on the way to the grocery store who has utilized one of the many functional uses of hemp, making all kinds of textile products and making them available for sale. This is across from my Starbucks where I buy my coffee for the commute. According to the signage, you can see they apparently specialize in medical marijuana. www.bestmeds under the sun. Lindsay, Katie can perhaps talk at the break about whether or not that's an acceptable <laughs> consumer representation. <laughs> this is where I buy my gas now. Oh, this is across the street from where I buy my gas now. Uh, a super entrepreneur who is focused on the convenience in a convenience store opened up his gas and grass. And as you'll note, CBD store is also now open. And for those who may want a less bold coffee flavor, you might check out this more low-key coffee, Coffee Shack, over on the west side of Colorado Springs. Really gets to the point with that sign. <laughs> it does. <laughs> now this is the uh, favorite or the most sad case. This used to be my family's favorite uh, Thai restaurant. We were super happy to see it being renovated because it needed to be renovated. Very unhappy when it, the Thai restaurant did not come back. 
the uh, landlord obtained a more lucrative business opportunity <coughs> for his space. So for anyone keeping track, all of those pictures that Paul took were on the outside of those establishments. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But as I say, the business is certainly booming in those states where marijuana and hemp and CBD are legal. Uh, as the practice continues to emerge from the business front, it's also certainly emerging into many different legal practice areas as well. What began with regulatory and license, licensing has certainly expanded into conundrums for HR and employment questions involving places, especially where recreational use is legal, but it's also expanding into IP, insurance, and now we're starting to see litigation pop up as well. I have a quick question for you, Paul. Are those all areas of law that Shook handles? Absolutely, they I just are. Wanted to make sure we could help in any one of those specific areas. Okay. So, what are we here to talk about? Cannabis. Uh, the question is: Is marijuana? Is it hemp? Is it CBD? Hopefully, you answered yes to all three. They all derive from cannabis sativa, the scientific name, and a herbaceous flowering plant that has many uses: uh, functional medicinal and recreational. And the legalities of the issues focus on the concentration of the psychoactive substance, THC, and Mike's gonna talk about that. Oh wait, before you go on, does anybody recognize these guys? Any of this growing in your backyard? <laughs> anybody recognize these guys? Does anybody know what scene this, mov this movie scene is from? Special prize for anybody who finds me at the break and can tell me what movie this scene is from without Googling it. <laughs> it's really scientific though, Mike, so please tell us. And it is, and, and that movie is available on Netflix. I double checked last night, so <laughs> you, you can look it up and get the whole story. Um, but Seth Rogen learns in the movie that, that the cannabis industry is really scientific, and that's becoming more and more the case. As we start to think about the difference between uh, marijuana-derived products and we start to think about hemp products and hemp-derived products, what are we talking about? Well, we're literally talking about the same plant, and the primary distinguishing factor is simply the, the THC that is in the plant and the derived products. And the THC is what gives the characteristic high that's associated with marijuana, and therefore it's absent from hemp and hemp-derived products like hemp-derived CBD oil, which is why we're starting to see um, CBD mainstream in a much quicker way, perhaps, than, than marijuana has. And it's why we see differing legal statuses, where marijuana is still a Schedule One drug under federal law. Um, hemp, we have a question mark there, but it has at least been uh, decriminalized. There's a lot of questions about particular uses. And then the state laws have really varied as well, with both marijuana and hemp moving in the in a path toward legalization, and actually very quickly, as, as you'll note, we have 10 legal states for recreational marijuana. We had to submit these slides some time ago, and just two weeks ago, the uh, state of Illinois also legalized recreational marijuana or set on the path to do that, so we're now up to 11, and that's a, a continuing theme you'll hear as we go through, is that this is literally a moving target. Texas yesterday signed a bill that changed the treatment of CBD. And so what are we talking about when we're talking about THC and CBD? What we're talking about are two of over 130 cannabinoids that are included in the cannabis sativa plant. These are chemical compounds that interact with uh, cannabinoid receptors in your body, so it is really very scientific. Th the main difference between THC and CBD, which are two of the most prevalent cannabinoids in the plant, is that THC tends to interact with the receptors in your brain, where CBD um, actually doesn't interact very well with those receptors and sometimes dampens the effect of THC, which is how you get some of the um, believed benefits of THC and, and, and CBD um, without the high when you're talking about hemp-derived plants. And so we wanna give you sort of an overview of the legal landscape across the country, um, but it's important to understand a bit on where we've, we've come from to get there. Let me skip the slide. There was a, so the, the legal landscape started um, back about 4,000 years ago when people started using um, hemp originally. Uh, the ancient Egyptian cultures and ancient Chinese cultures used hemp in a, a variety of products, including cloth and ropes, and that was continued through to early, early colonial America, and all of this really began to change in the early 1900s. Um, there was a bit of a... a, a a panic around the use of marijuana that led to all cannabis, including hemp and low THC uh, products being uh, made illegal. 
And then in the 1970s, uh, with uh, Richard Nixon's tough on crime legislation called the Controlled Substances Act, marijuana was scheduled as a Schedule One drug along with LSD and heroin. Um, regardless of the THC level, so that include, included hemp. So the cultivation, growth, and distribution of hemp in a domestic market was made illegal um, and, and subject to really significant criminal penalties. And that really didn't change, although it was controversial then, it didn't really start to change until the 1990s with some efforts to make medical marijuana available in a variety of states. That trend continued to where we now have an excess of 30 states with uh, some version of mar medical marijuana legislation. And then in the past five to 10 years especially, we've seen the growth in recreational marijuana um, with Canada making it legal on a national level and then 11 states with more sort of in the wings uh, within the US. And that, um, that has been on one track, but hemp's been on a little bit different track. And that started with the 2014 Farm Bill. And in the 2014 Farm Bill, uh, which was sponsored by Senator McConnell, who, who is actually very tough on marijuana, but sees a, a big opportunity for the state of Kentucky to be uh, active in the hemp market, um, helped uh, provide a pathway to the legalization of hemp-derived products by having pilot programs for the cultivation and growth. And then um, that led to the 2018 Farm Bill, which is really why we're here, because that's what's led to everything you know, going to pot. And what the 2018 Farm Bill did was to make a, a really dramatic change in the industry because it took the um, overarching definition of cannabis within the Controlled Substances Act from 1970 and said, well, we're gonna exclude um, what we're gonna call industrial hemp under federal law, which is that, that cannabis sativa plant, the same plant that marijuana um, is, and we're going to deschedule that if it contains below 0.3 THC. And so that's allowed for an expanded growth um, of these industries and because it's no longer criminalized. Although the federal government has kept a lot of regulatory power over the use of industrial hemp, including the USDA, who still has its pilot programs that are now expanded. And even today, which we're now six, seven months past the signing of the 2018 Farm Bill, there aren't any USDA approved pilot programs yet. So there's a question about the growth of um, hemp in the United States still, although they tell us that that may be resolved by next year. And then the FDA has taken taken an active role in its public statements about the use of um, CBD and other hemp-derived products. And I'll turn that over to Lindsay to walk through that piece. And, and just before we move on really quick, uh, Mike, Mike made this point, but I think it's worth emphasizing because we often see a disconnect um, when we're advising clients on hemp and hemp-derived products, and that's that the 2018 Farm Bill was signed into law in December 2018 we still don't yet have from USDA, i.e. the federal body, what will be the, the framework to implement that, implement the, the hemp um, programs and the program under which the states can uh, sign up and submit their own state plans. And so that's a long way of saying that even though, and this will come into play later with, a, with an example that I'll share, even though this farm bill has passed, we don't have the regulatory framework at the federal level, and until we have that framework, we won't have the regulatory framework at the state's levels. Uh, and so I, I just point that out because we'll have clients that say, well, this is legal now. And like, it is, it's more legal, but I think depending on where you are and maybe you know who the police chief is or who the prosecutor is or what their political agenda might be, it's, it, I think it's we're not quite at a point where we can just say, yes, it's legal, you can go forth and um, produce hemp and not worry about federal laws. And, and that point and the FDA point are the reason that you saw the question marks and it depends on hemp when um, depending on what you read on the internet and in, in literature, they'll say it, it's, it's legal in all 50 states, and, and that really is a, and it depends sort of an answer. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna talk more about marijuana later, but because of the consumer product landscape in the United States, we wanted to start kind of with CBD here. So does this mean that hemp-derived CBD products are legal now, and as we just said, no, um, but it's very confusing. Okay, so FDA um, regulates CBD products. So I think kind of first, we can kind of divide these into two buckets. First are non-food products. So really for non-food products, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, as long as you're not making a therapeutic claim or a disease claim, you're okay, <laughs> we would say. Well, you're in at least a, a, a more reasonable space. Really, that's what FDA is concerned about, and you need to get FDA approval for making those types of claims. Where things get more confusing is in the food and beverage space, and that takes us to kind of this third bullet on this slide. So in the food and beverage space, it's unlawful to introduce food or dietary supplements containing CBD in interstate commerce. 
And, and here's why, it's an interesting history. So actually in June of last year, so we're just at the year mark, the FDA approved a drug called Epidiolox, which is for the treatment of seizures. And you guys might, might have seen this in the news. It was a very newsworthy event because it's the first time that the agency approved a drug um, with the active ingredient that was derived from cannabis, specifically here, CBD. Um, so because we now have a CBD-containing drug approved by the FDA, the FDA's position is that these uh, CBD can't be added to food or beverages or such products would be adulterated. So that's how FDA is kind of now sweeping in all CBD products. Um, so that brings us to what I think is a very obvious question, why do I see CBD products everywhere? And the answer's been lack of enforcement. Um, the FDA just hasn't enforced you know, where it can in this area. The little bit of enforcement that we have seen has been focused on this therapeutic claims that I mentioned earlier. And so, at least from what we've seen, we think that the industry has kind of taken a cue from FDA and said, well, maybe I'm okay as long as I'm not making a therapeutic claim. But again, I think we have to keep emphasizing that at least from FDA's perspective, CBD and food or beverages in interstate commerce is not lawful. So is the CBD coffee shack on the way to Pikes Peak okay? We'll see, as long as it's not going over state lines, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, guess, uh, I guess that's probably what they're doing. Um, now, I think one other important distinction here is hemp. FDA has um, determined that there's three hemp-derived substances that are uh, generally, generally recognized as safe. So that's why you might see hemp-based proteins, hemp hearts, et cetera. But again, that's hemp, not CBD. Um, so what's the future for CBD? Uh, FDA actually very recently, I believe it was on May 31st, held a public hearing on CBD, THC, and other cannabis issues. Uh, it was a long hearing. Uh, a lot of stakeholders were there. People are very, very interested in this issue. Uh, what was clear from that hearing, uh, you know, as clear as anything can be with FDA, uh, a lot of the same kind of party lines were said over and over again. But it was clear that they're mostly concerned with unsubstantiated therapeutic claims. And they're also very concerned about the lack of science. Um, the agency stated again and again, we understand the consumer interest in this area. Um, but really, it's clear that they're not going to be moving very quickly. Um, we expect them to move very slowly and deliberately in this space. And I think really the only thing that might speed things along would be congressional intervention. Yeah, and I'll just add to that uh, real quickly before we jump into what some of the states are doing, that the way that, and I'm being very general here, but the way that FDA generally operates is it might issue a few warning letters to um, certain industry players, and it expects other players in the industry, other manufacturers, other retailers, to be aware that these letters were issued, uh, to read the content, and then to sort of take note or take heed of what's in the letters. And, and I say that because one little interesting shift that we've seen between FDA warning letters, which, as Lindsay said, normally focused on therapeutic claims like cures headaches, cures cancer, relieves stress. That's really what FDA was focusing on <clears throat> before 2019. There's been a recent um, spate of a few warning letters that still focus on those therapeutic claims. That's really what irks FDA, are those types of claims. But what, what we've noticed as well is that FDA is taking time at the beginning of the letters to say, hey, you know, first and foremost, you can't put CBD in food and CBD can't be a dietary supplement, and then they go into the therapeutic benefits issue. And so I say that because I think FDA has taken note that the industry is taking the view of, well, so as long as I'm not making therapeutic claims, I should be fine, and, and FDA is sort of saying, hey, let, let us remind you that these products actually aren't legal just without those claims as well. <clears throat> so we made some, some uh, slides to show whether the states are quote unquote cool with CBD. And when we put these together, it, it sounded really good. And now I feel like we just look really old by using the word cool, but, uh, <laughs> but, but here we go. Um, <clears throat> so some states have expressly permitted the sale of hemp derived CBD sales, or excuse me, the sale of hemp derived CBD products. Um, and, and so we've highlighted some of the states on here um, that, that, are, that fit into that category. I see um, Colorado. Yeah, yeah, Colorado's in there. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, so, and, I, and we will note, um, to Mike's point earlier, that we submitted these slides a while ago, and there actually are a few more states since we submitted them that have sort of moved over into this category of, of expressly, or like almost expressly, I don't know what the, the legal term is for that, um, allowed for CBD sales. Um, but just to focus on Colorado for a second, uh, Colorado has its own sort of statutory framework 
for the, the manufacturer shipping sale of CBD products. And, and just to be really clear, I'm talking specifically about CBD. Obviously, we all know, as Paul showed us with his <laughs> photos from the outside of the shops, um, that, that THC and marijuana products are legal in Colorado, but there's also a framework within Colorado for the actual sale of CBD products. And it's interesting because the, the framework itself actually kind of acknowledges that some of the, the state regulations regarding CBD and food, for example, run contrary to federal law. Uh, it, but in, in a, in the, the framework just says, you know, here's how you do it, and by the way, we're not trying to represent that you're okay under federal law by doing this, but you know, go forth and let's, I guess, sort of see what happens if you're, if you're in the industry and you want to take that route. And as we all know, and many, many manufacturers and retailers are, are going that route. Uh, then you have um, some states that have decriminalized hemp-derived CBD but lack regulatory guidance for the sale of the products. So, uh, and actually Kansas and Missouri are, are loosely in that category. So to contrast that with Colorado and those, those states we just talked about, these are states where no one said it's illegal, but they've also not said here's the framework and how you do it. Uh, and so we've highlighted some states on there. And again, there have been some shifts here and there. Some of the States like um, Wyoming or Texas that might have fit into the expressly per allowed might also fit under here. Um, but again, just an illustration about how quickly a lot of these issues are shifting. On this next slide, we highlight a few states where there is some form of marijuana that's actually legal, but CBD derived from hemp or marijuana is not yet legal. <clears throat> and so there's restrictions on the sale of CBD in pursuit of is it safe, are there issues that need to be evaluated differently for CBD products. Uh, however, as you might expect, California is leading the charge. The assembly in the state legislature has, legislation has already passed the assembly and it's pending before the Senate. As of about 10 minutes ago, I checked and it hasn't yet been passed by the Senate, <laughs> um, but maybe by the end of the day. Could be. Uh, on this particular slide, we show a few states where there actually has been legalization of CBD and use of CBD in various products. However, as the states still figure out how to regulate it, control it, make it available, there is very limited access or points of sale for CBD products. For example, in Iowa, our neighboring state here, uh, although legal, you can only buy it at about five different places across the state. Uh, so it still makes it very restricted in terms of its access. And finally, I will talk about states where CBD products remain explicitly illegal. Um, three of those states are highlighted here. Uh, I will note that as of May 24th, Nebraska is no longer on this list as the governor signed uh, um, a bill into law that, that uh, effectively allows for the sale of CBD products. Um, but these are states where, regardless of some of the developments and changes at the federal level and in other states, they've taken a strict um, this is still not allowed here. And, and I'll just tell a really quick, uh, give, give a really quick example of, of how some of the laws in states like this, as well as the shifting regulatory and state um, laws on these issues, can affect uh, those in the industry who are looking to uh, get into the sale of CBD products. And that is the case of, of the Big Sky Company. Um, and so, uh, real quick history the, the Farm Bill passes in December of 2018. The Big Sky, I think it's called the Big Sky Scientific Collective or something like that, I call it Big Sky, was formed very shortly thereafter in Colorado. And they, I think they thought, this is great. Hemp is, you know, federally, it's no longer criminalized. We're going to get in on this. And so <clears throat> after forming, they promptly ordered uh, 6,700 pounds of industrial hemp from Oregon, where it is was grown legally according to state and federal laws in Oregon. Um, and they had their driver you know, drive, drive the shipment to Colorado. While he was in Idaho, he pulled up to a way station and they said, what do you have? And he said, well, here's my bill of lading. I have 6,700 pounds of industrial hemp because, you know, what does he have to hide? This is legal now. Um, so that guy ended up in jail um, <laughs> and that was very unfortunate. Um, and he stayed in jail for several days until someone bailed him out. He still has a pending trial date in October and I suspect this will get figured out between now and then, but it just goes to show that, um, you know, the, the, the framework of, 
of the of what's going on in these states really affects industry. That 6,700 pounds of industrial hemp is still impounded in Idaho. Um, Big Sky has tried through various legal means to get it unimpounded, um, and, and they've so far been unsuccessful. So this is just a really good illustration of some of the um, challenges that, that those in the industry might face if they're trying to decide how to get in and, and at what level. All right, so what about marijuana? Um, as Mike mentioned earlier, we now actually have 11 states where it's legal for recreational use. That's with the addition of Illinois um, just about two weeks ago. And then 33 states where it's legal for medical purposes. Um, that said, as everyone knows, it remains illegal under federal law. Um, so how does that play out at the state level? Well, that <coughs> takes us to the Rohrabacher, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Farr Amendment and the Cole Memo. So at a very, very high level, the Rohrabacher Farr Amendment essentially says that the DOJ can't use federal funds to interfere with state medical marijuana laws. And that has to be renewed every single year. Uh, the Cole Memo uh, talks about prosecution and says the DOJ essentially won't, will put a halt on prosecution of individuals and businesses complying with state medical and recreational laws. Now, you might have heard about the Cole Memo because it's been in the news a lot lately. So Attorney General Sessions, when he was in office, rescinded that memo. Since then, Attorney General Barr has said, no, you know, uh, we're not going to go after people who are relying on the Obama-era policy. So uh, it's clear as mud, right? This is a memo that was in place. It was rescinded. Now it hasn't been reinstated. But we're, we're not going to go after you, so don't worry. Um, needless to say, I think that'll keep us all in business for a little while, right? Um, but as I said, it's, it's confusing. I think another really interesting thing that's happening in the space right now happened um, just at the end of last month in a case called Washington versus Barr, a case out of the Second Circuit. Um, so there, the plaintiffs challenged the inclusion of marijuana as a Schedule I drug. And the Second Circuit said, look, we agree with the district court. Uh, this case isn't right for review because you failed to go seek administrative remedies first. You need to go to the DEA and challenge it there. Um, but it's a very interesting opinion. If you have time, I would encourage you to check it out because the court kind of goes into this history of saying, you know what, the plaintiffs are right. The second, sorry, not the second circuit, the DEA has been dragging their feet. And so the second circuit retained jurisdiction and said, you can't bring the case here now, but you should go to the DEA. And if you do that, we're not going to retain jurisdiction indefinitely, but if you do that in the next six months, and the DEA continues to drag its feet and doesn't act quickly, you can come directly back to us. You don't have to refile at the lower court. You can come right back to the Second Circuit. And so I think that this is the court's way of trying to encourage the DEA to move things along. Um, they have many arguments in this case, but essentially kind of the crux of it, or at least from my perspective, what the Second Circuit took issue with is these plaintiffs, um, some of them are individuals with medical conditions being treated with marijuana, and they were saying, look, this actually saves our lives, and we're not able to do things like travel across state lines. And so the Second Circuit agreed with that argument and said, yeah, this is actually something that needs um, expeditious review. Um, last, we should note that Congress does try to be, seem to be at least trying to take some steps uh, where the government kind of isn't acting or the uh, Trump administration isn't acting. Um, one is the Safe Banking Act. So I'm sure people have seen in the news that this industry has created a huge issue because they can't be dealing with banks legally, and so it's an all-cash business. So at least where um, you know, the administration isn't signaling that they're going to move forward with decriminalizing marijuana, uh, we at least see Congress trying to step in in some areas that have been a little bit muddy. All right, so to wrap up and uh, get to questions, because I see our light's changing, um, Shook has done a lot of work in this area. We've worked with uh, manufacturers, we've worked with retailers, and we've worked with those really throughout the supply chain to help them look around the corner a bit to see what are the risks if you're going to be taking your product through Idaho, is that a concern? Um, and, and to think about what are ways through contracts, um, through review of representations by uh, manufacturers, if you're a reseller, et cetera, what can you do to put yourself in the best place to where you can be in this market and be as, be as well positioned as you're going to be? Because as we see question marks and it depends everywhere, um, entering this market's not without risk, but there are practical steps that you can take. And, and this team and, and a number of others at Shook have, have worked with a number of clients to help them navigate these challenging waters. So with that, I think we can open it up to any, any questions. Yeah, this question comes from the webinar. Um, they're curious to know, um, is, it, is there a problem with depositing money in a federal bank, like money from like a, a marijuana business? Well, I'll answer by saying 
<clears throat> first of all, very clearly, um, we're all really excellent product liability lawyers, and we're not banking lawyers, so that's my disclaimer. Um, but I think that, that generally speaking, without diving too far into it, is that the answer is probably at this point, yes. And it kind of depends on how much the business touches the plant. In other words, um, if you are a manufacturer who makes glass containers and you happen to sell glass containers to a marijuana uh, manufacturer, you know, th that's one thing. If you're actually um, a business that's helping to transport marijuana from one state where it's legal to another, that's probably a different consideration in terms of, of how much you're, A, touching the plant and then the legality of the banking. Um, and, and I will just finish by saying, in addition to my disclaimer, it is the banking is really complicated. It's a really big concern for the industry. It's something that, like Lindsay said, Congress is really working to address. Um, and I, I, I don't know that we can give much more of a clear answer beyond that. A little unsatisfying, so it, I apologize. It depends. It depends. <laughs> sure. What's the latest case law dealing with employers that have drug testing employees in states in which cannabis in some form is legal and the employee drops a dirty urine in the drug test? So this has been a, a, an interesting and recent evolution. Uh, the early, when Colorado had uh, medical marijuana and a number of the early states that had that, there were protections for employers in the statutes. There was a lot of case law that said, uh, whatever you're doing is fine. Just because we, we have decriminalized it or done something at a state level, that doesn't change anything. So the trend over the past year, especially, has been for states to look at that a little bit differently. Um, there was a, a statute just passed, I want to say in Nevada, but I, that I was reading about this morning, that says it's uh, illegal under state law to discriminate against an individual for using marijuana products. Now, just to use Missouri as an example, Missouri passed medical marijuana by a proposition um, that was voted on last fall. There is an explicit protection in that proposition, which is still in the process of being rolled out, that says employers are protected against making adverse, um, protected from adverse actions as a result of someone using marijuana. Now, that is helpful to employers that have some certainty, but there's a lot of discussion about what does that mean about an individual who has a disability, who needs it as a reasonable accommodation, especially if they don't have another reasonable accommodation that may work. So there's, there is some tension there, even in a place like Missouri, where I think there was some effort taken to clarify that. But the trend is that um, in a lot of states, you're having to start to reassess what you're doing and think about um, your, your drug testing policy and, and specifically to the people. Are they dealing with uh, manufacturing where they need to... Um, be sharp for safety reasons? Are you talking about somebody who's under the influence? What's it mean to be under the influence of marijuana? How do you verify that as an employer? And then what do you do with the situation where you have no evidence or reason to believe that somebody was under the influence, but because THC stays in your system for up to a few weeks, depending on how often you use it, you could have not used any THC containing product for several days prior to your test. And so all of those are issues that you have to go sort of state by state and really a one size fits all thing isn't going to work because you have to consider the, the disability issues, the drug testing issues, and then what the person's doing issues. So again, it's, it's a really hard issue, but and when we've talked to clients, it's a lot of avoiding really a, a overarching practice um, and you really do have to consider the various circumstances in the state and with the person that you're dealing with, which is, again, an unsatisfying answer, but really the only one that's um, probably a good one. One more? Yeah, this one also comes from the webinar. Um, they asked, uh, you mentioned there are issues with CBD legally being cited as having therapeutic properties. Does this extend to cases where CBD is combined with other beneficial substances um, and claims that the combined product has therapeutic properties? Yeah, so I think any time, I mean, FDA's position would be if you're going to make those kind of therapeutic claims in something that's ingestible, um, you know, a drug, uh, food, or a dietary supplement, that you would have to get FDA approval. So yes, even if it was combined with some other product, you would have to get um, FDA approval to make that kind of claim. All right. I think our time is up. Thank you all Thank very you. much. We'll behave your questions.